Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Western Governors Association webinar, the uh, Invasive Species Impact on Fisheries, the first webinar in the series for Hawaii Governor David Ige's Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. This is Bill Whitaker with WGA, uh, the Policy Advisor on Invasive Species Issues. We'll get started in a moment here, but before we do, um, we're going to hand it off to Kevin Moss from WGA, who will help us uh, go over some logistical issues. So, Kevin. Thanks, Bill. Hey, everyone. This is Kevin Moss with WGA. Um, we have a really exciting webinar lined up today. We're going to have three sections of the webinar. We're going to have opening remarks from each of our panelists, kind of laying out uh, some of the issues that um, we're going to be discussing in terms of, of invasives and fisheries. And then after that, Justin Bush is going to lead the panelists through a moderated discussion. And then after that portion, we're also going to have a Q&A with the audience. And so that will be your opportunity to interact with the panelists and send in any questions for them to answer. And the best way to do that is to um, enable the chat function on your WebEx platform. And the way to do that is to scroll to the bottom of the main screen and click that cloud icon, make sure it's turned blue. And then you can send uh, chats either to the other participants or to the panelists. And so to submit questions, what you're going to do is send your questions directly to me, Kevin Moss, and then I'll pass them over to Justin. And if you have any questions about any technical things, feel free to send me a chat message throughout the webinar. And also feel free to send your questions in at any point, either during the opening remarks, the moderated discussion, or at the end during the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And um, so as I said, uh, I'm Bill Whitaker. I'm the policy advisor with the Western Governors Association. I work on forest, range, and invasive species issues, but um, lately it has been uh, the lion's share of my work has been on invasive species issues um, because about um, a year and a half ago, our incoming chair, Hawaii Governor David Ige, indicated that he was interested in um, examining biosecurity and invasive species as his signature chair initiative. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the way that WGA works, um, fortunately a lot of you are. We've got um, a lot of really good sort of return visitors to a lot of the WGA events, but um, every we rotate leadership at WGA um, every year, and every year our chair governor has the opportunity to focus the association's attention on one specific issue. And um, Governor Ige, as, as the chair, um, decided to focus on biosecurity and invasive species issues. And so that is looking at um, how those issues affect the West as a region, um, both what is being done for a biosecurity lens to keep the um, the bad things out to keep um, pest pathogens, non-native species, from getting into the U.S., how um, gov states are working together, how states are collaborating with federal agencies, how the federal government's collaborating with um, other countries to keep the bad pests out, and then um, the second half, the invasive species aspect of what it is that land managers are doing um, once uh, new species are detected, how to manage um, lands once um, species are established, how to focus on things um, like eradication and um, monitoring and things along those lines. It's a year-long initiative, um, and the goal of it is to uh, have uh, facilitate a conversation with re regional leaders and policy experts to really drive at a set of new policy tools, best practice, practices, technical tools to address this issue, which is really one of the most pressing issues to the West and to um, Western ecosystems and economies. And uh, the, ki the initiative kicked off in June of this year. Uh, we had several, uh, we had four workshops as part of that uh, across the West. Starting in September, we had one every month, um, one in September in Lake Tahoe that focused on the prevention, control, and management of established species, one in Cheyenne which focused on invasive species and restoration, um, the one in Helena, Montana in November that focused on early detection and rapid response, and one in the Kona Coast of Hawaii that focused on biosecurity and agriculture. The, uh, that was last month, um, and then that was uh, concluded, our workshop series, and now we're moving on to the second phase of the initiative, which is the webinar series. Um, so this is, uh, thank you for joining us. This is the first in the series, and uh, we are going to be having these every month um, about, this, about this time up until May. 
And then all of this information is going, um, we're collecting, we're, um, we're listening as we go. All this information, all the comments received during the webinars and during the workshops are going to go to um, help us build an initiative appendix of all the comments that we've received, which will help us build a final initiative report, which will have our facts and findings, policy recommendations and best practices that we got out of this initiative. And so the reason we've chosen today to focus on invasive species, um, the in, invasive species impacts on fisheries is um, this, we are, we like to focus webinars on um, issues that arose during the workshops that we realized did not get enough attention um, and need some more specific focus. And so this has been an issue that is, and it's, it's an immense issue. It's got a lot of impacts on um, uh, wildlife, on native species, but also on um, the communities, the economic communities that depend upon fisheries. So this is an issue that arose um, through that, uh, but it also is an issue that arose through some of WGA's previous work on uh, invasive species. So if those of you who aren't familiar, that um, in March of last year, the Western Governors Association published its top 50 aquatic invasive species of the West list, and the concept was this list was to create a regional policy and um, tool, a prioritization tool, to um, getting together. We sent surveys out to the 19, um, uh, to our 19 states, to our 22 states uh, and islands, and to invasive species coordinators to ask them to assess what their top 50 worst invading, um, invasive species, most threatening invasive species are to their state. We tallied those lists and we published that in March to try to help create a, sort of a first of its kind regional planning and prioritization tool. And um, on that list, we divided it into aquatic and terrestrial species and on that list, number seven on the aquatic side was northern pike, which is going to be um, a, a large part of our conversation today. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, WGA list, uh, top 50 invasive species in the West, I would encourage you to check out our website or just type that into Google, you can find it on our website. And because um, we'll be referencing that throughout the call. And uh, I would like to thank our moderator and our panelists today for participating and all of you for joining. We really definitely do appreciate it. Um, our moderator today has worked on invasive species issues on, on federal, state, regional, and local levels um, for over 10 years now. Um, he has uh, really proven himself, I believe, to just be a regional leader and sort of a real source of innovation leadership on invasive species in the West. Um, he's worked all over the West. He's studied in Hawaii, um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Central Washington University, and Portland State University. Um, I think he's just a real asset to have today to moderate, and uh, we're thrilled to have him. So, and that's uh, Justin Bush, the executive uh, coordinator for the Washington State Invasive Species Council. Um, he will be leading a discussion today on this issue, and I'll let him introduce the, the panelists. So, Justin, thank you for um, helping us out today, and I'll, I will hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. It's an honor to be the moderator of this webinar today. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Western Governors Association and the Association Chair, Governor David Ige at Hawaii, for their commitment to addressing invasive species across the West. I was able to participate in one biosecurity and invasive species workshop held in 2018 and, and thought they were very valuable and provide an excellent forum for highlighting the problems that we face across the West. The Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative has already helped to identify collaborative solutions many of the invasive species that we face in the West, and I really look forward to the solutions and outcomes that will be presented in the initiative report in June, as Bill had mentioned. Uh, WGA will be updating their invasive species policy resolution based on these recommendations generated throughout the initiative, and so just know that the discussions that we're having and the questions that you are asking as participants will help feed that. Um, today, we are focusing on one invasive species problem that requires Western states and territories to work together to solve, and that problem is invasive fish with a specific emphasis on northern pike. And while specifically focused on northern pike, I'm confident that the themes and takeaway messages shared by the panelists will be beneficial to any invasive species manager across the West. It is a General introduction, uh, invasive species are non-native species that have been introduced outside of their native range, and those species cause harm to the economy and the environment. While northern pike are native to portions of the West, today we're really focusing on the areas of the West that they are non-native and where they cause harm to the economy and the environment. 
within the Columbia River Basin in Washington and Oregon, northern pike are non-native and are considered to be invasive species. In this area, northern pike are actively being prevented from being introduced and spreading to water bodies and within the water bodies that they're found and that they have been invaded, efforts are being made to contain, suppress, and eradicate those northern pike where possible. It's important to realize that predation of northern pike uh, has really wide-reaching um, impact. In the Columbia River Basin, over one billion has been invested in salmon recovery over the last two decades. This investment and the progress made toward recovery of those species are directly threatened if northern pike continue to spread downstream in the Columbia River and they begin to prey on salmon and steelhead. Predation of northern pike on salmon and steelhead also threatens the investments made in fish hatcheries by tribal, federal, and state governments. The predation also threatens catch availability for tribal, commercial, and sport fishing harvest. At this point, the full economic risk is unknown, although it certainly could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars annually. And it's also important to realize beyond the economic impact, the predation of Columbia River Chinook specifically threatens the food availability of the critically endangered southern resident killer whales. In addition to that, uh, any other species that requires these uh, Columbia River fish for survival uh, could be impacted negatively. While all of this sounds extremely bad for the Columbia River Basin, there is hope. These economic and environmental impacts could be fully prevented, minimized, and mitigated through swift actions that we can take together to address this problem. But we need your help. And the panelists today will outline some of the actions that are in progress or could be coming in the near future. So to set the stage, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, I'm pleased that the panel includes Joe Maroney, who's the Director of Fisheries and Water Resources with the Kalispell Tribe of Indians. For over a decade, the Kalispell Tribe of Indians have been warning fisheries managers of the Columbia River Basin that northern pike are coming and that they should be afraid. I'm really sorry to say that northern pike are now less than 12 miles from the Columbia River Basin and Adermas Dam and the Steelhead a situation that constitutes imminent threat of an environmental emergency. I'm also pleased that this panel includes Laura Robinson, Program Liaison Coordinator with the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. The Northwest Power and Conservation Council has been highly engaged on this issue in the Columbia River Basin by hosting regional forums between Native American tribes, federal bureaus, state agencies, and others. The Council has taken a leadership role in developing an economic analysis of Northern Pike's threat to the Basin. Last but certainly not least, I'm proud that Parker Bradley, uh, invasive species research biologist with the State of Alaska Department of Fish and Game is able to join us today. The State of Alaska has directly experienced what Northern Pike can do to salmon fisheries in South Central Alaska where the species is non-native and considered an invasive species. The state of Alaska has made great strides in addressing this problem and has learned a lot of lessons along the way that may be helpful for managing northern pike in the Columbia River Basin. Together, these panelists will be sharing their perspectives and the experiences of their organization. The panelists will then answer questions in panel format, and then we'll take live questions from the audience. And as Kevin had mentioned, if you have questions throughout the panel presentations, please uh, message Kevin Moss and he'll pass those along. Um, and so with that, um, I'd like to pass it to Joe Maroney, our first panelist. Joe Maroney is Director of Fisheries and Water Resources with the Kalispell Tribe of Indian. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about the history and the current status of northern pike um, within the Columbia Basin. So um, to kind of give some folks that are on the phone a little bit of context, um, this slide kind of demonstrates the, the level of introduced species within the Pacific Northwest. So within Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, you can see since the 1900s up until the present that the number of introduced species has increased. Um, what I really want to point out is within each one of those states, what's highlighted in green and kind of the, the scale format is that is the number of introduced species that are fish that are within particularly the state of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. 
So you can see in Washington, there's 149 introduced species that comprises plants, animals, reptiles. Um, 66 of those are fish. So you can kind of see at least that there's a, a you know, demonstrating that there's a huge issue with it. Um, so northern pike and why are they bad? Um, they're an apex predator. They are highly invasive and can cause large scale changes within the fisheries community. Um, and when they're introduced, they can significantly reduce prey densities or eliminate entire species. Um, and they're highly fecund. Um, some females can produce up to a quarter million eggs um, and they can live over 20 years and grow to over uh, 45 pounds. So that picture that you can kind of see on that lower right, in, uh, that was a fish that was captured in the Ponderia River in 2008. Um, it's a 37.5 pound fish that was 44 and a half inches in length. Um, this would have beat the state record by about three pounds within the state of Washington. So um, the next slide, it has the, the geographic, the distribution of northern pike. So the um, kind of the tan color with the yellow circle around it that goes into the Midwest, that is the native range of northern pike. Um, there's also a small little section that's up in that northwest portion of Montana. It's on the other side of the Continental Divide where northern pike are also um, considered their, their native. Um, that drains in the Saskatchewan drainage. Everywhere else um, throughout the entire west and also um, on the east coast, uh, northern pike are, um, that's outside of the native range and so they're non-native and, you know, considered invasive. So. This was a slide, unfortunately, um, I was not able to um, have the animations with it, but basically what it was to show is going from 1948 up until the year uh, 2018, the amount of distribution of points of northern pike. So in 1948, you can take a look at, on the map, there were three points that were sped across that entire slide. Um, the tan portion is the native range. And as you can see through a time sequence, it kind of looks like that there's been a severe case of chicken pox. And you can see, you know, this expansion of what has happened over, you know, years. So they've really, really expanded outside of their native range. Um, the area with the purple circle is the area that I'm gonna be talking about, um, which is in the Northeast corner of Washington. So this slide right here with the area around purple, this shows um, the area that's in red. It starts off on the right side of the slide. That is Flathead Lake. It flows down. Um, pike were introduced in the 1950s through the Flathead and Clark Fork system, and they've been slowly making their way down um, to the area that's in the purple box, which is Lake Ponderé. The Ponderé River flows north. Um, you can see that there's lots of hydropower projects, um, a lot of FERC projects. And the expansion has continued to move down to where now, as Justin was saying a little bit earlier, you know, they're 12 miles from, uh, you know, Reach and Grain Coulee Dam. So um, the expansion of pike has been, you know, pretty severe. They've also have been within the area around Post Falls, that is the Coeur d'Alene Subbasin. Those fish have been in there since uh, the last 40 years. And those fish have been, you know, kind of slowly trickling. But where we've seen the, the greatest amount of expansion has been in the Ponderé and the Clark Fork subbasin. So the area that the Cowspell tribe has been working extensively in is in the Ponderé River in northeast Washington between Albany Falls Dam and Box Canyon Dam. There's also another hydropower project, Boundary Dam, um, which is up by the Canadian border. And I'll talk a little bit about that, kind of talking about some of the um, problems that we ran into when we were encountering northern pike and you know some of the actions that we ended up taking. So one of the things when pike first showed up in uh, around 2004 is you know we were a little concerned and both the Kalispell tribe and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, basically came up with a messaging and that pike are a problem and they're not an opportunity. Um, so what we did is we established management goals. We wanted to minimize the impact to native species. We wanted to reduce the spread of pike to other waters, including the Columbia River. And we wanted to reduce the numbers of pike in Box Canyon uh, Reservoir. Um, that second bullet, reducing the spread, well, you know, that's one of the biggest concerns that we're faced with right now is, is pike continue to, to move down 
throughout the Pend Oreille and into the Columbia River system. So this action timeline right here, and so 2004, Northern Pike were first detected in Box Canyon Reservoir. Um, in 2005, we started initiating some surveys and some studies. And five years later, in 2010, we conducted what was our first uh, SPIN survey. And SPIN is an acronym for doing spring pike index netting. It's an index to kind of gauge what the population of pike is doing, and we can compare it from year to year. And then in 2011, we initiated our um, first pilot suppression project within Box Canyon Reservoir. And at the same time, we were also doing um, lots and lots of outreach and education and also regulation changes. Um, during that time, um, Northern Pike, they were classified as a game fish and also a prohibited species. We removed the classification of game fish at that time, which helped um, move forward in doing suppression efforts. So beginning in 2012, we started doing a full-blown suppression effort within Box Canyon Reservoir. And um, we still continue that. Um, we have plans to be doing that in this coming spring. And also in 2017, we started doing full suppression within Boundary Reservoir, um, which is that reservoir that is immediate below um, Box Canyon. So here's a slide that kind of gives you an idea of the level of effort that we were putting in in order to, to suppress northern pike, and we were suppressing them through gill netting. So in 2012, you can see the level of effort. We had about 1,000 gill nets that we set out. In 2013, we sent out almost 1,200, and then you know we started continuing that level of effort. The level of effort that we're doing right now currently is we r roughly we've cut that number you know significantly. We're only putting out a couple hundred nets a year and we're calling it good. Um, but to give you an idea of the context of what the suppression um, effort is, is over the, the time period is 5,000 gill nets, which is about 140 miles. Um, and one good thing is we've been actually able to see the decline in that, which is this particular slide. This is what I would call the the bread and butter of the presentation. So in 2012, you can see the yellow line, which is the number of northern pike that were removed. And then the blue line is our catch per unit effort that we were monitoring through our spring pike index netting. Um, when I'm focusing on that yellow line with the, with the red dots on there, so in 2012, we got roughly 6,000. 2013, we got about 6,500 pike. And in 2014, we got roughly about 4,000. You know, after for three years of doing suppression, we were a little concerned that, um, you know, could we even be effective in doing this? There was lots of people throughout the Columbia Basin that were saying there's no way that you could do it within a large reservoir. Um, to just give you some context, Fox Canyon is 55 miles long and it's roughly about a half mile wide. So it's a, it's a really, really big system. But where we were concentrating our removal efforts was in isolated locations where we knew pike were. So we were a little nervous after when we hit 2014 when we had 4,000, it was kind of, of an oh boy moment. Are we actually doing anything? And it wasn't until when we hit 2015 when we saw significant reductions. And in 2017, we had 32 pike that we collected and in 2018, we had 271. So we've been able to reduce it from, you know, five to 6,000 pike down to, you know, within the teens or hundreds, which I think was, you know, pretty impressive. Um, and I think the, the takeaway from that is having at least three consecutive years of doing um, suppression efforts. So we've removed roughly about 17,500 pike from Box Canyon, which is roughly about 42,000 pounds of pike. Um, so the success to date is, you know, removed 17,500 pike from Box Canyon. We've demonstrated that we've been able to reduce the population by about 98%. Um, and we also demonstrated that, that, that it's feasible and you can do it on a large scale program. And Parker is gonna be talking a little bit later about some of the work that they've done up in Alaska. Um, which, you know, very similar, and I mean, in some regards, I mean, a much more, you know, robust effort. Um, as Bill was talking a little bit earlier, is pike are really, really bad, and they are on the top 50 list for the Washington invasive species. We went through a ranking and prioritization process, 
a couple of years ago when Northern Pike ranked out in the top 50. Um, and Bill had also mentioned earlier about the west-wide invasive species through the Western Governors Association, those survey results. So this is where he was talking about pike being number seven. So these are the top 10 established aquatic species and pike being number seven. Um, and you can see the, the number of participants, which includes 17 states. So it's a, it's a pretty high issue for, I would say, all of the Western states. Uh, there's becoming more and more increased awareness of Northern Pike through um, meetings, through social media, through uh, letters to the governor, through Penoir. There's lots and lots of action that has taken place right now to, to raise this awareness, which I'm, I'm happy to see. And, and I think this webinar is a, was a good um, you know, move in that direction. And you know we're going to be talking a little bit more about as pike are continuing to move down, moving into the anadromous zone. Um, this is a picture of pike that was caught in Lake Washington, um, which is on the west side of Washington. It's you know very very concerned from all fisheries managers, and people should be very concerned um, if these things um, get established and if they take hold, because you can see you know whole scale changes in fisheries communities. So anyway, definitely want to thank the, the funding aspect that we've had enabled to accomplish this through Bonneville, um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, of Vista, you know, State of Washington, and our staff, because it takes a lot, a lot of effort in order to, you know, pull off something like that. And we're going to, you know, talk about that a little bit later as far as, you know, it's got to be a coordinated effort. So anyway, um, thank you. And I will pass it off on to uh, Laura. Great. Thank you, Joe. This is, is Justin, and as uh, we get ready for Laura's presentation, um, I'd just like to note that the, the takeaway from the Council Tribe is that we can do this, and we know how, um, which I think is, is a really great example of success. Um, so I'm uh, pleased to welcome our next panelist, Laura Robinson, is the Program Liaison Coordinator for the Northwest, Northwest Power and Conservation Council. Um, Laura, when you're ready. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, good morning, my name is Laura Robinson and I work for the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. Um, uh, thank you, first WGA, for um, having me this morning for this exciting and important discussion. Um, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council is a compact interstate agency uh, working in the U.S. portion of the Columbia River Basin. We have two governor appointed members that represent each of the four Northwest states Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And we have three specific roles that Congress gave us. Um, first is to protect, pr protect, mitigate, and enhance fish and wildlife habitat impacted by the hydro system. The second is to ensure the Northwest an adequate, efficient, economical, and reliable power supply. And the third is to conduct all of our work in public. So one of our main tasks from Congress is to develop and amend and work with the region on a fish and wildlife program. Our current program that we work within is the 2014 Fish and Wildlife Program. This program has 23 st strategies to recover and protect fish and wildlife, two that are of particular importance to this topic of Northern Pike, um, the non-native and invasive species strategy and the predator management strategy. Um, each of these strategies have multiple measures to address the strategy, and while the 2014 program doesn't have Northern Pike specific language, um, the language in each of these strategies generally applies to this issue. <clears throat> so Congress directs us to amend the program roughly every five years. Um, to do this amendment, we receive recommendations from Fish and Wildlife Managers um, around the region who are with the Native American tribes and um, state and federal agencies. Um, we also receive public comment on those recommendations and throughout the entire program amendment process. So both the recommendations from the Fish and Wildlife Managers um, and the public comments um, are really what inform the amendment and um, tell the council what to put into the next program. Um, we are currently amending our 2014 program, actually, and in December, we received 51 sets of recommendations. 
Um, once the recommendations period closes, um, we opened up a public comment period on those recommendations. Um, so we are currently in that public comment period, and I have a link on um, my PowerPoint. If you would like to go to our website and review, read and review those recommendations, and if you would like to provide any public comment on those recommendations, now is the time. And we are very interested to hear what um, folks have to say about how the next program should look. Um, and also on our website, um, if you scroll to the bottom, you can also sign up to just stay informed on um, this program amendment process and other council processes if you're interested. <clears throat> so right now, the stage that staff is in right now is we're really digging into the recommendations. While we're in the public comment period, um, we're not really um, in a place where we're able to start making decisions on the program um, amendment. Um, we're still receiving information from the region. So um, we're still digging into the recommendations, and essentially what we're hearing right now um, for Northern Pike specific recommendations are four main things. First, that the program should support a coordinated regional strategy to control invasive species. This generally, from the recommendations, is a three-step process for regional prevention and management of Northern Pike. The first step is to de detect their presence early and respond rapidly. The second is to educate the public on the impacts of Northern Pike. And the third is to prevent, control, and stop the spread of Northern Pike, and to encourage fish and wildlife managers to develop and implement harvest and management regulations to minimize downstream impact. The second thing we're hearing from a lot of folks is that um, economic reviews and analyses are needed on emerging invasive issues, such as the proliferation of northern pike in the basin. <clears throat> the third thing is to fund the suppression work throughout the basin using Bonneville's mitigation funds. And the fourth is not specific to northern pike, but is also very much related, which is to develop a common metric to evaluate the effects of predation by fish, birds, and marine mammals. So um, taking a little bit of a step back, actually, um, before we received all of our, fish and or all of our recommendations, um, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, or PENWR, had a meeting in July um, where they had a separate forum that was specific to Northern Pike. Um, the, there was so much energy in the room, a lot of interest. The room was packed. Um, this is clearly an issue that people are really taking notice of. And um, from that meeting, one of the takeaways was that um, folks wanted to see an economics review of um, the impact of Northern Pike in the Basin, both where they're at now and also if they were to spread, particularly into the anadromous waters of the Basin. Um, so <clears throat> the council used to have a group called the Independent Economic Analysis Board, or the IEAB, um, and they did various economic analyses for the council in the region. One of particular note um, was a few years ago, they looked into what the impact would be on the natural resources in the basin if quagga and zebra mussels took hold here. And so folks brought this up in the meeting and said, you know, could we get um, a review like that for Northern Pike? Um, well, the council, or the IEAB actually hadn't had an assignment in a few years, so their charter expired at the beginning of last year, so they are no longer a group. Um, but the council pursued this, you know, saw this as um, a big regional interest, and there were several council members that were supportive of this, and so staff pursued it and um, began working with the council members for a request to the Independent Scientific Advisory Board um, to look at an overall science review of predation in the basin, and then also to include a few economists who could look specifically at the impact of northern pike in the basin. Um, we received three letters of support for this from uh, Penwer, from the Washington Governor Salmon Recovery Office and Washington Invasive Species Council, and from the Oregon Invasive Species Council. Um, and um, we received council support and approval and sent a letter to the ISAB last month. And then actually yesterday at our council meeting, um, the council members approved two economists to work on the economics portion. So um, this is moving forward. Um, we have, in the request to the groups, we had two specific science questions on Northern Pike, 
and two economics questions specific to Northern Pike. Um, for the science questions, the first question is, what level of suppression is needed to reduce the population in Lake Roosevelt to a level sufficient to reduce risk to spread downstream? And the second, what are the likely ecological impacts of Northern Pike should they enter the basins and adromous waters? And then the two economics questions are, um, number one, what information is needed to assess the economic impact to natural resources in the basin should northern pike spread throughout the anadromous and non-anadromous zones? And if such information exists, can you estimate the economic impacts of the spread of northern pike? And number two, for the related ISAB question regarding the level of northern pike suppression needed, can you calculate the costs associated with that? So um, the ISAB and economists have begun work on this, and the report should be complete in May or June. Um, it's a quick turnaround, but we really feel that this report could help inform the Council's program amendment process. So we ask that it um, be complete in time to loop it into the draft. Um, another important aspect of the Council is um, the projects within our Fish and Wildlife Program that are funded through Bonneville's Mitigation Fund. Um, we have a program of $270 million with 369 projects across the U.S. portion of the Columbia River Basin, Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Um, there are two in particular that focus on Northern Pike. The first is um, the Roosevelt Fisheries Evaluation Program. Um, this is a long-standing multifunctional project um, that the three co-managers of Lake Roosevelt work on together. Um, those co-managers are the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Spokane Tribe of Indians, and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And in June of 2017, after the Council received um, a couple emergency funding requests from the co-managers, the Council asked that the co-managers develop a coordinated proposal to address Northern Pike. And so the co-managers did, um, and in 2018, they came forward to the Council with a new project a new coordinated approach called the Northern Pike Suppression and Monitoring Project. Um, this project was recommended by the Council for um, FY 2019 BPA funding. Um, the Council did that in June of 2018. The budget for this project was about $900,000, um, and that's what the co-managers felt was necessary to um, suppress the population that's already taken hold in Lake Roosevelt. Um, the funding so far for this project came from um, the Council, since the 2014 program, has been able to um, conduct something we call cost savings. So we're able to capture funds from projects that close out and redirect those to new projects. So in the case of Northern Pike, we were able to help um, buy some new gear at the end of FY18. Um, also the Colville's Fish Accord, some of that money goes towards their Northern Pike efforts as well. Um, but with those two pots of money um, combined, it was not sufficient to fund the project for this year or going forward. So what is next? Um, right now, you know, we're anxiously awaiting the science and economics review. Um, we feel that this will be very informative for our regional partners and our program amendment process. Um, we are also amending the Fish and Wildlife Program. Um, and as I mentioned, since we're currently receiving um, rec or comments on the recommendations, um, we're really in a listening and learning um, stage. But once the comment period ends in February, um, we will be able to begin um, actually making decisions on how to amend the language in the program. Um, and as always, um, the Council continues to support a regional approach to suppressing Northern Pike. Thank you. Great. Th thank you, Laura. <clears throat> um, one thing to note is, is to take action. So the participants definitely consider commenting if, if, uh, if you have interest. And I'd really like to commend the Northwest Power and Conservation Council for the Science and Economic Review. That's going to be really excellent to understand the risk and needs on, around this issue as, and also provide a tool for advocating for uh, sustainable uh, programs. Um, so I'm uh, happy to introduce our next uh, panelist Parker Bradley is an invasive species research biologist with the state of Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Go ahead, Parker. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, 
As you said, my name is Parker Bradley. I work for Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I work primarily with pike. And uh, I'll be talking about the impacts of invasive northern pike in the Susitna River drainage here in Alaska. So here's a map of Alaska showing the distribution of northern pike. Uh, we're a bit unique because we have an extre extremely large native range of pike. Um, as you can see, that's those diagonal red lines. Uh, but where they're considered invasive in Alaska is in the south central part of the state, and that's the uh, solid red right there. So that's where my uh, presentation is going to be focused. So northern pike were brought down into the south central region of the state in uh, the late 50s or early 60s. Uh, it's believed that they were brought in by a float plane operator uh, from the northern part of the state where they're native uh, to a specific area called Bolchitna Lake. And over several decades, uh, pike began to spread on their own and also with the help of people. And so this is kind of what we're looking at today. Uh, we have over 100 water bodies with invasive pike. Um, and honestly, we don't even know the full distribution of pike. Um, there's just so many remote areas that uh, we haven't even got a chance to sample. So some of the uh, ecological effects that uh, we've documented and also other people have documented is uh, primarily the heavy predation on juvenile salmon and trout. Uh, in some areas they're able to actually extirpate the salmon and trout, others just severely reduce their populations. Uh, but we have quite a bit of evidence that pike specifically target salmon. Uh, and so what happens is when uh, pike are introduced to a new area that also have salmon, often they'll They'll target salmonids, and then when those populations are depleted uh, or become extirpated, then they'll shift their diet over to other species of fish there. Um, oftentimes up here, it's uh, sticklebacks or sculpins. Then once those populations are depleted, then they'll be consuming primarily invertebrates because that's all that is left. Um, invertebrates aren't a very good food source for pike, um, so as a result, the pike population stunt, the fish just can't get very big. So when we go to an area and we see um, primarily invertebrates in the pike stomachs, we know, one, they've been there a while, and two, they've already depleted all the other fish resources there. So a case study I'm going to highlight here, it's one of our biggest suppression projects. Uh, it's going on in Alexander Creek. Um, it's a system that's relatively remote in nature, uh, 26 air miles northwest of Anchorage. Uh, the only way to get to it is to uh, boat to it or fly to it or snow machine in the wintertime. Uh, it's the first in a series of major trips to the Susitna River. Um, at the head of the, the creek is Alexander Lake, um, 880 surface acres, and then the creek itself is about 50 uh, river miles. Historically, it was a very large Chinook salmon producer, very popular sport fishery, and I'll touch on that. But uh, pike were introduced into the lake into the, in the mid-60s, uh, and they were pretty happy there for a while, but over time, uh, over the course of several decades, they trickled their way down the creek, and then by the 1990s, uh, they pretty much occupied the entire drainage. So this is a pretty good example of why pike should be considered a significant threat and how under the right conditions uh, the fisheries can be destroyed. Uh, so Alexander Creek Chinook fishery historically supported uh, 13 fishing lodges, six charter companies, multiple air charters, boat rental facilities. Uh, it was a multi-million dollar industry. Um, but returns began declining and in 2008 the Chinook fishery was closed to harvest and it's been closed ever since and as a result, that industry has collapsed. So here's a figure that I think really highlights uh, the impacts that pike have been having on Alexander Creek specifically. So this shows escapement counts for Chinook salmon in Alexander Creek. And what we do each summer is fly the creek with the helicopter, count the number of Chinook salmon, and that's what these uh, represent. And as you can see, we've been doing it for a while, began in 1979. And so the range that we want the number of fish to be in um, is between 2,000 and 6,000. That's sort of the goal we manage for. Um, as you can see, we haven't even been close to the minimum for a while. The last time we actually met the escapement goal was in 2005, and then we just barely met the minimum uh, there. So it's a pretty dire situation. But what highlights the specific impact that pike have been having is when you compare it to a similar system with similar uh, escapement counts, in this case the Talchuitna River, 
As you can see through the 80s and 90s, they had very similar uh, escapement counts, similar peaks, similar troughs. But by the time pike began occupying the entire Alexander Creek drainage uh, is when they really began having an impact. And you can see that in the early 2000s, the escapement counts began to deviate substantially. Um, and they haven't been uh, similar to each other in quite a while. Now, if you assume that Alexander Creek escapement counts would have been similar to, continue to stay similar uh, without pike, uh, then you can contribute about an 80% reduction in the Alexander Creek Chinook uh, population to uh, the northern pike being there. So what we're doing in Alexander Creek is a big suppression project with the goal of driving down pike abundance to allow for increased survival of juvenile salmonids. Um, and what we do is we set gill nets in the side sloughs and side channels of the creek. Uh, it's one of those really windy creeks with lots of oxbows uh, like that in that top picture there. So this project began in 2011 and uh, we set gill nets during the spring when pike are spawning. That's just when they're most active uh, and have the most movement, most vulnerable to our gear. And we have two to three field crews that target about 60 of these side sloughs and channels. And since 2011, we've managed to remove just over 20,000 pike from this system. And it, uh, in order to try to measure our success, we're, we've been conducting surveys to evaluate juvenile salmonid abundance with either minnow trap surveys or um, with all the pike that we capture, we're actually opening their stomachs um, and analyzing the stomach contents because uh, pike are essentially swimming minnow traps. They're going to tell you what's there. And so with both of those data, we've been able to document an increase in the distribution of juvenile salmon in Alexander Creek and also uh, increase in catch rates, so uh, pretty encouraging. So some of the management strategies that we utilize, uh, first, prevention is the most effective strategy. It's often the cheapest. But, you know, for populations that we do have, uh, monitoring is key, um, even monitoring places that don't have pike, which can result in early detection uh, of when the problem may be small and before it gets out of hand. We also have to do a lot of prioritizing because we have a relatively small staff, limited in resources, and we have over 100 water bodies to deal with. We just can't work everywhere at once. Um, outreach is also a big component, um, educating the public. Uh, we, we could always do more of that, of course, but educating them about not only uh, just northern pike, but also invasive species in general. We've had some pretty good success with some eradication projects uh, for northern pike, and I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. And then uh, suppression is also a tool that uh, we use. And besides Alexander Creek, uh, there's about five other suppression projects uh, that we're doing. Uh, we also utilize angler harvest as a tool. Uh, you know, it's a very popular sport fishery, of course, uh, and we've uh, liberalize the regulations to allow people to harvest uh, as many pike as they want. And we're always exploring new tools, new technologies, uh, new techniques for, uh, to help us with, with any of those things listed above. So probably the biggest milestone we've had in our program when it comes to eradication is uh, the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, so on the Kenai here in South Central, uh, pike were introduced in the 1970s. And as of October last year, the Kenai is now pike free. Uh, the locations with northern pike are shown in the black dots there, uh, or the black lines. And uh, yeah, we've, we've had some really good success finally eradicating pike from the Kenai. So really big uh, success story for us. And then also the, uh, the Anchorage area, you know, unfortunately people move pike around. That's why we're in the situation that we are. Uh, but they moved pike to certain locations, and in the Anchorage area, we were successful in eradicating those. And most of this is all with uh, uh, chemical treatments. And we, were, in total, uh, eradicated pike from about uh, 20 water bodies uh, in the south central region of the state. You know, so in conclusion, as many of you all know, there's a lot of factors that can impact salmon runs, some more than others. Uh, we've documented in the south central region of the state, uh, pike predation can be uh, one of the things that just tips the scales in the wrong direction in certain habitats and just be the scale that, or the uh, straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, and I know there's a lot of things affecting the salmon runs in the uh, Columbia River Basin. Uh, so just kind of to highlight what you know, adding one more thing, uh, specifically pike predation to that list, uh, what, what it could potentially do.
Uh, so that's that's all I have for my presentation, and uh, thank thank you for your time. Great, thank thank you, Parker. The uh, the lessons uh, learned from from Alaska are great. I, I'm really scared to learn more about Alexander Creek and thinking about the Columbia River Basin and what that might mean in our area, but. Um, I'm also feeling pretty good about some of the successes that you've had on the Kenai Peninsula, specifically in another area. So I think there's a lot we can learn, and I really appreciate you being here today. Um, yeah. With that, we're going to pivot to um, a series of questions for the panelists, and we'll follow the same order, same speaking order. And uh, for those of you that are tuning in, if you have questions, again, um, please message Kevin Moss, and he'll pass those along. So for the panelists, our first question is this. Currently, the impact of northern pike predation to salmon and steelhead haven't occurred. From your perspective, is enough being done to prevent these impacts? And if not, what more could be done? Uh, Joe Maroon? Uh, sure. Thanks, Justin. This is Joe. Um, I guess the, the, the quick and easy answer to that would be no. Um, you know, even though that the impacts haven't occurred for salmon and steel that I guess I kind of equate it to is it's an accident, a car accident that you're waiting to see happen. And if there's something that you can do to potentially, you know, mitigate that, um, do something now rather than, you know, as a species takes hold, because there's lots and lots and lots of evidence and documentation out there. And I think Parker did a good job describing what happened up in Alaska that um, you better do something before it's too late. Great, thank you, Joe. Laura Robinson? Um, so, you know, many managers in the basin are working really hard to suppress northern pike and keep them from reaching the anadromous waters. Um, I know the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Spokane Tribe of Indians, Kalispell Tribe of Indians, Coeur d'Alene Tribe, WDFW, the Mid-Columbia Public Utility Districts, and probably others um, working in the basin that I'm just forgetting right now. But, um, you know, it's my understanding that what is being done so far um, by these folks is the best that these managers can do with the time, resources, and funding that they have available for this work. Um, additionally, other groups, um, such as the Forest Service, are conducting studies to better understand the genetics of northern pike and how they're spreading. Um, but there's still a lot to learn and a lot of work to do. Um, and um, I feel hopeful that the ISAB and Economist um, Science and Economic Review will hopefully give us further information on what needs to be done to suppress the current population. Great, thank you, Laura. And for Parker, from your experience in Alaska, can you recommend any actions that managers in the basin should be considering? Uh, you know, it's, I, I have a kind of general idea what's been done, but you know, as far as the specifics, uh, I don't know exactly what has or hasn't been done, but um, that being said, I think one of the real important things to be doing, if it's not already, is uh, having a contingency or response plan in place for when pike do get to the anadromous waters, um, and then knowing what course of action will be implemented, uh, who the responsible parties will be, uh, what permits or authorizations will be needed, uh, just so you can hit the ground running. Uh, and also having a clear understanding of who has management authority for each section of the reservoir that pike may be found in. Um, also identifying partners and the roles and responsibilities of each uh, would be very helpful. And then uh, having permits and agreements uh, between agencies, partners, leads in place uh, right now for the response. Um, you know, having permits in place for the response isn't a viable option right now, uh, at least having some of the permit requirements, timelines, app application materials identified, and then also uh, just as important, having a response budget available as well. Great, thank you, Parker. Um, so on to our second question. Um, we all can see that northern pike predation impacting over the, the billion dollars of salmon recovery investments alone uh, is an emergency. This is a little different than other emergencies, like a wildfire, for example, because the rate of spread is slower. And um, as kind of Joe had said, uh, you know, it's almost like a car crash in slow motion in some ways. And, um, and so this prompts the question of when to recognize an emergency and initiate an emergency response. So in your opinion, at what point should the situation in the Columbia River Basin be considered an emergency? And we'll begin with Joe Maroney. 
Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, whether you want to call it an emergency or an emerging threat, um, you know, I guess it kind of gets into semantics. Uh, but I think it's something that's coming. It's something that, um, as far as local jurisdictions, fish and wildlife managers really, really need to be concerned about what they're going to do. And the, and I think particularly when you're looking at the huge investment that has taken place within the state of Washington, particularly the Columbia River, um, it's better to do something now rather than do something later because the costs associated with that um, are going to be significantly less. When you look at the invasion curve that's used, you know, at the national, state, and federal level, if it's something that you can tackle early on, the costs and associated with dealing with it are much less rather than when the species gets established. So, isn't an emergency today? Um, it's definitely going to be emergency, um, and it could be an emergency in a couple weeks. Um, so, I would say, why not declare it now? Thank you, Joe. Laura? So, um, in, you know, all of, our, all of our work with fish and wildlife issues in the basin, the council really relies on the fish and wildlife managers and their expertise to tell us, um, you know, what's going on and what should be done. And um, the recommendations for the current program amendment process show that the managers are already considering, you know, this question. And they have asked the council to support a coordinated strategy and rapid response approach. Um, also, there are work groups um, and coordination forums all around the region that um, are focused on Northern Pike. Um, one began uh, last year that the Colville Tribe and Spokane Tribe hosted um, that began a discussion with fish and wildlife managers, electric utility groups, and policymakers. And one of the outcomes from that two-day meeting was a draft rapid response plan for the region. So I'd say there's um, a lot going on in the region to prepare for an emergency response um, if that is needed. Great. Thanks, Laura. And um, Parker, do you have any guidance for the Columbia River Basin, or, or did you have the same type of conversation in Alaska as well? Uh, yeah, you know, um, kind of going off what Joe said, Regardless of what you want to call it, um, it, it seems like the northern pike spreading into the anadromous uh, section of the Columbia is, is pretty highly likely. Um, even though it hasn't occurred yet, uh, the, just the current proximity to the anadromous waters should already constitute uh, an emergency or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and then obviously planning uh, for the response should be underway. Um, and then, you know, there's been a lot of research already documenting what pike can do to certain systems, and you don't want to wait for those impacts to be occurring to declare things an emergency. I think you just have to, uh, to plan for it and uh, expect it. Great. Thank you, Parker. So um, on to our third question. The Great Lakes region has invested significant resources in studying the feasibility of new technologies for prevention and containment, such as bubble barriers, acoustic, and electric deterrent. Could these technologies be effective in the Columbia River Basin, and has this been studied? Uh, Joe Maroney, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you, Justin. Um, I think when we start looking at um, what they're doing in the Great Lakes to prevent Asian carp um, moving up, um, I don't know if that's a, a similar, you know, situation that we could apply here when we're dealing with fish that are migratory. So when you try to install, whether it be bubble barriers or acoustic or electric deterrents or, you know, nets in order to prevent these things from going downstream, when you're dealing with native species that are migratory, salmon, steelhead, and in the areas that I work with, you know, you got migratory bull trout and cutthroat that are moving throughout the system. Um, I mean, there's lots of FERC licenses that are in play right now where fish passage is a high priority and it's being done and constructed. And then you've got all of the passage that's on the, the main stem, you know, Columbia for salmon and steelhead. So it would be interesting, you know, as time and technology can allow for that where you could potentially selectively get rid of northern pike from continuing to move down throughout the system. But I think it's a challenge. Great. Thank you. Uh, Laura Robinson? Um, so, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Managers, like Joe and his crew, 
who are conducting the on-the-ground work um, and have the hands-on experience in suppressing northern pike, um, I really defer to them um, as they have that um, unique expertise. Um, but the ISCB report will be looking into suppression efforts from around the basin and also outside of it, including the Great Lakes area. Um, so I imagine their report will likely touch on various technologies for suppression, and then the economists will follow up with that um, and take that information um, and evaluate the cost for those suppression efforts. So um, I think by the summer, um, when we have that review in hand, we could have some pretty valuable information on suppression techniques, effectiveness, and costs, and some of these new technologies and um, their applicability here. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Laura. And for Parker, has Alaska investigated these new technologies, or could there also be a potential benefit to your work? Uh, you know, the short answer is no, and probably two big reasons. First, as Joe touched on, it's kind of a, a non-selective barrier. Um, there's other fish to consider uh, that have very important fish passage needs. And then second, you know, those technologies require pretty large pieces of equipment or frequent maintenance. And a lot of our problems, you, it's in areas you can't even drive to. Uh, they're just way too remote uh, for, for big pieces of equipment and logistically uh, just be pretty difficult. So uh, we have it. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you also. Transitioning to our fourth question, the largest barrier to effectively address this problem likely involves financial resources. Is enough funding being directed toward this issue? And with a follow-up of beyond money, do we have enough trained personnel, supplies, and equipment available and ready for rapid response? And we'll lead off with Joe Maroney. Uh, thank you, Justin. So is enough funding being directed towards this issue? I, I guess from each one of the co-managers co within, I would say, the Columbia Basin, the answer I'd is short, probably no. Um, not enough money is being directed toward it. And I think particularly when it gets into dealing with a rapid response is what happens if Northern Pike show up in X water body? Um, is the state, is the co-managers ready to deal with it? And is there funding associated with it that you can tap into at a moment's notice in order to proceed and move forward on that? That's why I think having a I think a, an emergency type of a fund that's available within the Columbia Basin or states or provinces, however you want to look at it, that you can tap into a moment's notice and at the same time contacting people that have dealt with Northern Pike. I mean, to give you a, a really, you know, not to dive into it a whole bunch, but when Northern Pike first showed up in the Ponderay River, if someone had come to me and said, hey, Joe, uh, we've been dealing with Northern Pike for eight or nine years. We can come and help you. And oh, by the way, you don't have to pay for it. Um, we can help that service. I would have gladly, with open arms, said, yes, come and help. Because I think that that is, you know, getting from other people's effort and their experiences is absolutely crucial. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Laura Robinson, same question to you. Sure. Um, so, you know, the council um, really supports the work going on to suppress Northern Pike, um, particularly in Lake Roosevelt. And um, like Joe said, um, it doesn't, th there's not enough funding currently right now for this work. Um, you know, funding has been a challenge um, for Northern Pike monitoring and suppression efforts. And um, there are many efforts around the region to identify funds and folks um, to work with to cost share. Um, and um, the Lake Roosevelt co-managers um, have been working hard to seek grant funding and cost share um, all around the region as well. Um, from the council's cost saving effort, we were able to um, help with some new equipment and a new boat for the monitoring and suppression work um, that was recently um, purchased um, for the effort in Lake Roosevelt. Um, however, additional and you know, new and updated equipment is needed regularly for this effort, and so um, more funds are going to be needed. And right now, there's not really a good system um, in place for those funds to be um, funneled over to the folks working on this. Great. Thank, thank you, Laura. And for um, Parker, uh, the barrier, whether it's financial or trained personnel, supplies and equipment, 
um, how how was that barrier addressed in Alaska? Uh, well, you know, the funding barrier does continue to be a roadblock, um, and also uh, staff resources. You know, we have four uh, full-time employees dedicated to dealing with the pike issue um, up here, plus a couple summer techs that we hire, uh, but with over 100 water bodies to deal with, that's just highly inadequate. Um, while staff salaries, they are on stable funding sources. Uh, we only have one budget that actually comes to the state. Uh, most of our project work is externally funded through grants, um, and that's just how we've been able to do a lot of our work. Uh, another really big barrier we had was public perception um, about the pike in the south central region. Uh, we didn't really do anything for about half a century on pike in south central. Uh, being that they were introduced in the 50s, uh, really wasn't until the 2000s that we began to ramp this program up. So changing uh, people's perception about uh, the issue was, was a big hurdle, um, but we've, I think, come a long way uh, with improving our communication and outreach efforts uh, regarding that and have started gaining a lot of support. Excellent point. Thank you, Parker. Uh, so on to our next question. Coordinating effective response to invasive species across jurisdictional boundaries is extremely difficult. This issue in the Columbia River Basin uh, impacts tribal nations in addition to uh, provinces in Canada, as well as multiple states in the United States. Um, so is current leadership and coordination effective? And if not, what, from your opinion, should, should be done to improve coordination? Uh, Joe Maroney? Uh, thanks. Um, you know, this is, I think, uh, the answer to this question is kind of fluid. Um, I think we've been kind of learning as we've been going along and as the expansion of Pike <clears throat> continues down throughout the Columbia, um, I think people are becoming increasingly aware that it, it kind of takes a village in order to deal with something like this. So, and Parker hit on it a little bit earlier with one of his answers, what I thought was excellent is, you know, having permits in place, having staff that have the availability, the funding associated with it to move forward and, and tackle that. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, this coordination effort and who takes the lead on it and how it gets, um, I kind of look at it as if, the, the situation that happened in Montana in regards to zebra and quagga mussels when they were found in the reservoir is you have a emergency response team that you kind of go through a plan in order to deal with it when they show up in, you know, in another section of water body. I think we're getting there, but I think the, the education, the outreach, the um, attention that is being given, and I think this webinar is a, a good stepping stone for that, is having the governors, the states work together. And it's a, it's a cooperative effort where um, you have to look at jurisdictions as, you know, we're trying to get at the conservation outcome. So the tribes, states, feds, local folks need to work together um, because everybody has something to lose if nothing is done. Thank you, Joe. Laura Robinson, same question. Yeah, so one thing that is needed is, um, and, it's, and we're getting there, I think, but it's an understanding that this is really a regional threat and that those who have Northern Pike in their area should not have to take the burden on alone. Um, there are coordination forums and work groups, many that have been mentioned today, um, for Northern Pike that are really popping up all around the region, and they're engaging more and more people. Um, to improve coordination, I think the region um, needs to continue this work and really continue to create space for interaction and knowledge sharing and funding opportunities um, with Fish and Wildlife Managers and their partners throughout the region. Um, again, you know, I commend the WGA for um, this webinar as well. This is also another really good forum for this. Um, our current 2014 program um, says that the council will continue to coordinate regional stakeholder groups and partnerships on the issue of non-native invasive species particularly those species that pose the greatest risk um, to the Columbia Basin ecosystem and the regional hydropower system. And, you know, one of the Council's greatest strengths is its position to assist in coordination and facilitation of fish and wildlife managers, subject matter experts, independent science, and other regional partners. And um, the recommendations we received so far um, for the next amendment really um, build on, to, on that. 
um, to continue coordination and collaboration on this topic. Great. Thank you, Laura. And for Parker, what lessons could we learn from your experience in Alaska around leadership and coordination? Uh, well, you know, um, up here our authorities are, are certainly not as complex as they are down there. Uh, so, you know, that's not likely to change. Um, it's nice that we have just jurisdiction on managing all fish in the, in the fresh waters of the state. Um, however, we do work with quite a bit of federal, other state, local, NGO, and even uh, tribal groups on uh, the pike issue. Uh, so every year we meet with everyone um, in all of those organizations involved in the pike work, uh, share ideas, provide updates on projects. Uh, so we are proactively working with a lot of groups to solve the problem together, uh, but it just takes, it does take a lot of coordination and open communication among the organizations involved. And then another thing that helped uh, was that we developed a, uh, the management plan for Pike specifically. And once that structure was in place, uh, we were able to seek funding and uh, develop our Pike program even further. Excellent. Thank you, Parker. Um, so on to our next question. What are the most helpful ways that Western governors and take action to support the control and management of invasive fish species. And we will start with Joe Maroney. Uh, thank you, Justin. <clears throat> I, I think the most helpful way that governors can take action is, is um, there's an increased awareness of it. Um, as you can see from the ranking that was done, at least by the 17 states through the Western Governors Association, you know, Piker number seven. Um, having this issue be raised, not just at a state level, but also what I would say is, is at a federal level as well. And whether that be a coalition to get, um, you know, go back to DC to get additional funding. Um, the unique thing is, is the way that a lot of money has been streamed into the zebra and quagga mussels is through WERDA funding, which is the Water Resource and Development Act. And a lot of federal funding gets funneled through there to, de to deal with zebra and quagga mussels. I think that once the economic analysis is done on Northern Pike, it'll kind of highlight what the threat is. Um, if Pike end up taking over within the Columbia Basin and what the threats are. And having some money, I think from a federal level to tackle that is I think gonna be very, very useful. But you know, it's, I, I think you know, this is one of those questions that we're gaining more and more traction on. And as you know, this webinar kind of is highlighting is it's a, not a moving target, but it's moving target in the right direction to get that increased awareness that, I mean, this is a serious threat and it's a serious problem that we need to address throughout the Western US. Thank you, Joe. Laura Robinson? So one piece of action that the council members often take with important issues is to write a letter to our elected le or leaders to direct their attention and support to that issue. Um, I think the governors of the Western states could further support work on Northern Pike by urging the elected officials in their state legislature and their federal representatives to take notice of this issue, educate themselves and their staff, and provide assistance where they can. Um, I think the governors could work with their policy offices and staff that focus on natural resources, invasive species, salmon recovery, and the like, um, to allocate funding um, to help stop the spread of these voracious predators. And also, um, you know, I think that, um, like Joe said, you know, the, the word is getting out there, and as more, you know, as the economics review comes out and more of this work comes out, um, people are becoming more and more aware of it. And we really need to make sure that anglers throughout the basin um, understand Northern Pike and their impacts so that, that when they're out in the water, um, they can help remove them. And um, the governors could put into place, you know, outreach or coordination plans for their states that allow for the posting of signs at boat docks or boat inspection stations at common fishing areas um, that could encourage media coverage on the issue and um, just further collaboration within their state's partners. Thank you, Laura. Um, Parker Bradley? Uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, I guess a few things. First, it would be nice, uh, you know, if we could get support for streamlining of uh, permitting processes and uh, mainly for a rapid response 
of uh, invasive species eradication. Uh, some of these processes take uh, a really long time and we're just watching the, the problem get worse as we're waiting on uh, permit procedures to go through. Um, also identifying uh, priority invasive species issues, uh, supporting legislation aimed at assisting invasive species management in each state, uh, including rapid response fund, and then uh, maybe even proposing funding on the operating budget uh, for project resources and uh, personnel. Thank you, Parker. And we're on to our final uh, question before we transition to questions from the audience that have been received throughout the webinar. And the final question is, are there specific policy barriers that make it more challenging to manage invasive fish species than other types of invasive species? Joe Maroney? Uh, thank you, Justin. I think one of the, the barriers that we've been faced with for the last several years, and we got that, over that hurdle within the state of Washington, is pike were initially classified as a prohibited species similar to snakehead and piranha, but they're also classified as a game fish. And then when the Fish and Wildlife Commission removed that game fish status, it allowed um, the state and the tribe to actively go after northern pike. Um, I know within Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia, pike are kind of treated as a, as a bad species. Um, they're prohibited. I know within the state of Oregon, they're in the top 100 list. In Washington, it's the top 50. Um, but that's not shared throughout the other areas within the Columbia Basin, and I'm talking about Idaho and Montana. So, you know, I think having a policy that um, that these fish are bad and they know they don't know any jurisdictions and no boundaries. So, um, I always kind of say is that water flows downhill and so does fish. I, I think that's kind of one of the biggest policy barriers that we're that we're bumping up against. But I think having an increased um, effort being made um, through the governors, um, it, it might shift that pendulum to the to the side where you know we might need to start managing against these species. And I think it's also kind of difficult because I mean, I mean, pike are fun to catch. They're big, and um, they can provide a, a fishery. But there's also a cost at that where it can really affect not just treaty fisheries, but all the salmon steelhead and native fish recovery efforts that we're trying to do. So it's, a, it's difficult. Thank you, Joe. Laura Robinson, same question. Sure. So I would say, you know, agreement and funding are the biggest barriers we've seen so far. So, you know, working across various jurisdictions allows for really wonderful things like co coordination and collaboration but it can also make reaching an agreement difficult. And um, like Joe said, fishing regulations vary from state to state, and an invasive species in one state can be a game fish in another. Um, at the council, we're aware of the differences that exist among the states, tribes, and federal agencies. And you know, we really work towards an approach that is appropriate for the region as a whole, but um, it's not easy. Um, as for funding, unfortunately, there is a fear that when you put money towards something like an invasive species like northern pike, um, then that sends a signal to the rest of the region that it's your responsibility to manage that invasive species and that you need to, you know, put in all the money for that work. Um, but um, the council really sees that there's a need for the regional approach to managing and funding this issue, and um, we are working um, with our regional partners to try and get there. Parker, same question. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, for us, one one thing specific to pike is uh, the fact that they're both invasive and native here, um, and and they're not very far away. Uh, you know, part of the state. So that's kind of tricky. They're managed two very different ways, and so public perception about that. You know, some people take that the wrong way. So. We have to do quite a bit of uh, specific outreach in regards to that topic. Uh, second, I'll mention it again, uh, permitting and, and, you know, the length of time it takes uh, could definitely be reduced or more streamlined both on a state and federal level, uh, especially for some of the well-established methods that we've 
uh, you know, proven we can do. Uh, we've done dozens of times. Um, and for us, some unclear regulations on the importation of species uh, that could become problematic. We have we had multiple species pop up in the state um, that shouldn't be within a thousand miles up here. And, uh, not sure how they're getting up here, um, but some of the regulations regarding those are not very clear. And then, you know, also, you know, being such a big state with a lot of remote areas, uh, enforcement resources are limited um, and oftentimes difficult to implement when, uh, when it comes to invasive species violations. Thank you, Parker. Uh, we're now going to transition to some audience uh, questions, and we'll follow the same order uh, that was followed throughout the webinar. So, first question um, is directed specifically at Joe Maroney. Uh, gillnets have worked well upstream of Grand Coulee Dam and the Columbia River. Will they be too general in terms of uh, their use within the, the areas where salmonids are, are um, located within the Columbia River? It seems like uh, there could be a bycatch issue. Can you speak to that, Joe? Yeah, thanks, Justin. That, and that's a really good question. I, I think when um, when northern pike start getting in the anadromous zone, and this gets into the permitting um, uh, situations that Parker's highlighting, is so the permits that we have to get for doing our guild ending is we have to get a Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife permit, and then we also get a Section 10A1A permit through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When you start getting into the anadromous zone, one of the other permits that you would have to get, and it would be a take permit through NOAA Fisheries. So that adds another complexity when you start getting into the anadromous zone, where when you set gill nets in in that those bodies of water, that you're setting them in the appropriate locations where you can minimize the amount of bycatch um, without harming other species. Um, to give you kind of an example, as we start doing gill netting in sloughs to the pond array right at ice out, so the first week of March um, when the water temperatures are really, really cold, that's when we start gill netting and the amount of bycatch that we get is, is pretty minimal and what we do get, the, the survival is pretty high because the water temperature is pretty cold. But when you start getting into that anadromous zone, that adds a huge sense of complexity in trying to, you know, get another permit where you're dealing with, you know, endangered salmon and steelhead. Thank you, Joe. Uh, that was directed to Joe, but Laura or Parker, do you have anything to add? You know, I don't. Joe is really the expert on this, and I learn from him constantly on suppression efforts, and so I um, defer to him for this one. Yeah, I can uh, probably touch on that a little bit. This is Parker again. Um, you know, it's obviously something that we deal with as well every year, and we do our best to minimize that, minimize bycatch. And uh, the two big ways that we do that is uh, both by time and space. Uh, so we also do our netting in the spring uh, before salmon show up. Uh, by the time mid-June rolls around and when salmon start showing up, we pretty much stop, stop the gill netting. Uh, just to reduce that. Also, you know, if we do do gill netting uh, in times when salmon, or if there's concerns for uh, rainbow trout, uh, often we'll we'll target kind of the backside of sloughs, as Joe mentioned. Uh, try to keep nets out of the current where you might be more prone to catching uh, rainbow trout. Um, also, you can do things like uh, adjusting your mesh size. Um, you know, just the way uh, pike are built with sharp uh, teeth all over them, they're more prone to getting caught in smaller mesh sizes uh, versus other fish would be less prone. Um, and so, so those, those are some of the things that you can do. Also, more frequent checks uh, to release bycatch. Uh, you know, just because a, a fish is caught in a gill net doesn't mean it's automatically dead. It's, it's certainly stressful for them, but uh, checking nets more often uh, might have to be uh, something that's done as well. Great information. Thank, thank you, Parker. This next question is directed at Laura, Laura Robinson. Laura, when does the Fish and Wildlife Program Amendment public comment period end? 
Great question. Um, so I was not super specific about that because there is some discussion on that right now. Um, so right now we have it set to end on February 8th. Um, however, with the government shutdown, um, I know there's been some discussion about potentially giving a little bit more time. Um, one thing that's important to know is that the public comment period or the public comment is received for um, the program throughout the entire process until the last three weeks before we adopt the program when we have to go ex parte and not talk to folks. Um, but otherwise, um, we really accept comment the entire time. So um, we have a date of February 8th right now so that then um, the council members can really start to make decisions on um, how the amendment will look later um, based on the recommendations and comments, but folks can keep giving us comments after, after February 8th. It's just really a time, we, we have to set a deadline so that we can start our work. Thank you, Laura, that was very helpful. The next question is directed to Parker Bradley. Parker, you'd mentioned that certain areas are now considered Northern Pike free. Um, what's the process for determining that? And can you speak about how you can guarantee that an area is Pike free? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I would not want to throw the word guarantee out. Um, the systems that we recently what we would call eradicated the pike from. Uh, we use uh, the chemical rotenone. And right now, um, I could almost guarantee they're pike free just the way, uh, since they were just recently done. Um, the other areas that were maybe treated, uh, you know, years ago, if, if there's pike in there, it's likely a result of people moving them. Um, it, extensive surveys were done in the area to document the full distribution of pike um, and all of the distributions that were known were uh, included in the treatment plan. And, you know, considering we are just now calling the uh, Kenai Pike Free doesn't mean we're shaking our hands and walking away from it. Uh, there's going to be constant monitoring over the next several years just to uh, kind of double check and keep a tab on things. And as I mentioned before, uh, hopefully if they are still there, um, get some early detection on it so it could be uh, rapidly dealt with before the problem gets too big. But, uh, you know, there's no, no guarantees in anything, but we have a high degree of confidence and we're going to continue to monitor it. Great. Thank you, Parker. Um, the next question is also for you. Uh, what have you seen in terms of Northern Pike establishing in estuaries and brackish waters in Alaska? Hello, Parker. Hey, sorry, my uh, having issues with my phone. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Um, so, have you seen northern pike established in estuaries and in brackish water in Alaska? Uh, that's a great question. So, uh, I probably didn't show. I didn't show the map for very long. Um, but we have, there has been reports of pike being captured in uh, some of the Upper Cook Inlet area of salmon fisheries, um, and that is brackish water. And we think that's how pike have started establishing populations on the west side of Cook Inlet, um, actually swimming through brackish water, likely in the spring when the, the river discharges high, and then going up into uh, some of these systems on the west side. And uh, we, we started a project actually on the west side of Cook Inlet last year uh, doing a population estimate slash suppression project. And there's some technologies out there that we're actually going to utilize to hopefully see if any of the pike in that system did enter the marine environment. Uh, it'll involve uh, looking at some microchemistry in the otoliths um, to, to further document that. But there has been reports and now pike uh, are in systems that they either got moved there by people or they swam through brackish water to get there, so. Excellent. Thank you, Parker. So um, I'd like to thank all the panelists today for their time. I feel like we've explored research and preparedness and different ways to respond, and I really appreciate everyone joining us. And with that, I will we'll pass it to Bill to wrap it up. 
Thank you, Justin. Um, thank you for doing an excellent job moderating. We definitely appreciate that. And um, thank you to Joe, Parker, and Laura for being our panelists today. Did an excellent job. It was great to have your expertise and experience in the conversation. So just one um, very quick uh, housekeeping note to all the participants today for everybody listening in. Listening in, we really appreciate you joining. Thank you for taking part of this, and we encourage you to um, stay tuned, check out the, uh, go to WGA's website, westgov.org, and check out the initiatives page for more information on the remaining webinars in the series. We'll be doing these um, through May, and then uh, look for the uh, all leading up to the final initiative report in June. And um, one thing I would also um, encourage you is we will be posting soon the YouTube video of this, so you can, you can watch it and you can um, feel free to share that link and send it around to some of your contacts. And I would, um, there were a lot of federal agency staff who um, I'm sure I would be interested in this who are not able, weren't able to watch today due to the federal shutdown. I just encourage um, you when the government reopens, uh, send it out to your contacts and make sure people um, have the opportunity to watch this as well, federal employees. But with that, I would just thank you, um, thanks everybody involved for their um, participation today. I thought it was a great webinar and stay tuned for uh, the rest of the series. So thank you.